again. So for those of you who are out there in the, in the world, hopefully our stream is going to start up. Let me make sure I actually have my microphone turned back on again. Microphone is on. Technology is a beautiful thing. Thank you, Catherine, for, yeah, for yeah. saying this. Back so forth. We are live. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So what did, when we were looking at the help, what's new, was there anything that jumped out to you as, wow, I didn't know that was new in Paratext? Okay, there's silence. <laughs> All the registration things, yeah. We're going to, again, tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to be spending in most of the entire day talking about registration and migration and playing with it and migrating and killing and putting it back together and doing that. So we're going to talk about registration and migration. We're not going there. Anything that stuck out to anybody is new? Well, that's, that's a bummer because the whole the rest of the day today, what we're going to be talking about is what's new in Paratext 8. That was the topic for today, really, what's new in Paratext 8. This first session was really to try to get us just so that we've, we're kind of on the same place in terms of getting around the interface a little bit, getting, getting things around, you know, how we see our windows. We're going to spend a lot more time on Thursday talking about setting up the windows and getting them organized and, and working with that. We're going to talk a lot more um, about some of the issues of um, how the menus work. But today, for the rest of the time today, what I want to do is take you through a series of discussions of what's new in Paratext 8. Now, there's a video on this. The video um, was done several months ago. Back, it was actually done back in about October. It will cover basically the same thing. It lasts about 17 minutes. Um, we're going to take the rest of the day. Uh, so you can watch the video if you want. Um, if you watch the video, you'll be hearing me too. Um, but you, you know, it's whatever you want to do. Um, but we want to we want to talk about what's new in Paratext. And to do this, some of these things, some of these things, I'm going to just describe it and talk to you about it. So in that case, I might say, OK, class, take your hands off your mice. and <laughs> Look up here. Um, for some of them, I'm going to have you do the exercises. I mean, for some of this, we're going to be, we're going to be doing exercises. But, but part of it um, is really I just want to demo some things. And, and some of the things, some of the things actually we can't really do the exercise simply because we don't have all the, the the stuff we need to do it. So some things we're going to be doing exercises, some things I'm just going to be demoing. The first thing that we're going to deal with is, is actually we're just going to touch on it today because we're going to spend a whole day on it on Wednesday, and that's the assignments and progress. And I just want to um, share this with you. So take your hands off your mice. Okay. You can actually look up here with me. And what we want to do, I want to just kind of take you through. This, is, this to me, assignments and progress is one of the most significant changes from Paratext 7.6 to 8. Okay. From 7.5 to 7.6, there were a lot of new changes. And we'll be going through a lot of those. So if you've been using 7.6, you will have already seen some of those changes. But from 7.6 to 8, there's really only a few small things. One we already talked about, and that was the downloading resources. Okay. So we already talked about how the resources are different. The other is registration and migration. That's, that's new. The other really big change is how we deal with project management assignments and progress. Okay? And, and to me, this is, it, it's, it's a truly amazingly powerful tool that I'm afraid we may not utilize well because some people are going to go, oh, that's just way too much. So we're going to spend a day on it on Wednesday. So today, I'm just going to give you an overview. Okay? So don't get overwhelmed. And don't say, oh, I can't do that. We're going to take time, and we're going to practice it 
We're going to play with it. You're going to get to set up a project. Um, you're going to set up progress. But today, I want to just kind of show you how this works. And so when we're in um, Paratext 8, and I have my project open here, if I click on project, I notice at the very top menu that assignments and progress is gray. Again, you don't have to do this yourself. You're going to do this yourself on Wednesday. So just follow with me, because if, when, when, if, you, if you're looking down doing it, then what happens is all of a sudden I'm gone. Class, I used to be a teacher. I, I, I can see when people are sleeping. I, I, you know, I, I sleep all the time in class. Um, okay. So um, what's hard is that we've got two screens here. So some of you are looking at that screen, which is great, because I think that's a better screen, actually. This, sc this screen is kind of dull. That screen's a better screen. Um, so you can rearrange yourselves you know, at, at other times. Anyway, so if I'm on project and the assignments in progress is gray, then that means that this, this project has no plan made for it. Okay? That's what it tells me. There's no plan made. So, the first thing that I would need to do is to make a project plan, and project plan has a menu. So very quickly, I'm just going to run through this, and again, we're going to spend time. Notice there's a guide. Hint, hint, hint. There's a guide. But when there is no project plan, they give me some instructions that the first thing I should do is manage my plans. I should choose a plan. I'm going to choose a plan, and in this case, I'm going to select the plan that is the TSC, the seed company plan, simply because I'm SIL and I want to show no favoritism. So I'm going to show, choose the seed company plan. And when you, cop, when you, when you prepare a plan, you'll notice that there's, there's a series of items that are stages and tasks. And I'm going to copy that plan in and click OK. And now I have a plan. And you'll notice that there's a new icon showed up. Woohoo! Okay, and it looks like a little plan thing. You know, this is my progress. Bar graph. This is my this is my plan. This tells me what's going on. So when I click on that icon, that's the same thing as if I clicked on this assignments and progress. You'll notice that the menu now is dark and there's an icon. And again, remember that when you see an icon in that menu, that tells you you know, that you can use that. This icon does not show up on my main toolbar. It shows up in the window. When I click that, this opens up my assignments and progress window. And this is, to me, one of the things that just makes this so super powerful in Paratext 8. Paratext 7 had the ability to have a progress plan. You could create stages. You could keep track of things. But in Paratext 8, you as the consultant or administrator can do lots of things. Now, again, we, we have a whole mixed group here. Some of you are, are translators. You are the most important people on the team. Some of you are consultants who are really important. Some of you are administrators. You're just the administrators. Okay. The You're the money guys. <laughs> Okay. But the administrator, the administrator and the consultant are the ones who can set up this plan. Translators don't have the authority to set up the plan, typically. It's the consultant and the administrator. So if you are a translator, and I don't, do not mean to minimize that, or an observer, then you're not going to see a lot of what I'm showing here. Okay? You're going to see kind of something different. But if you are the administrator of a project or a consultant on a project, then you're the one who's going to be setting this up and helping the teams set this up. Okay, and so we have a plan, and basically I just took this straight out of what the seed company plan gave me. Okay, there's some default plans that have been made up. Wednesday we're going to talk about how to modify that plan and how to, how to adjust things. Okay, that, that, that'll come. But when you're in this plan, and, and if I'm the administrator, then I have the ability to go through this plan. And you'll notice in the middle column, an assigned, an unassigned. Right now, nothing's assigned. So the first task that needs to be done in this project is to do the exegesis. 
Well, I can look and say, who's going to get assigned to this? By default, my name is there. I've not added anybody else to the project right now. So for the moment, I'm just going to assign myself that task. So I'm going to do the exegesis. Yeah, you can only do this as administrator. administrator consultant can do this, uh, do the assignment process. Okay. And the thing is, is that what I'm assigning myself is right now I'm in the current book. So I need to know what current book I'm in when I'm doing this. We'll, again, talk more about this later, but one of the, the requests is for a bulk assignment ability, to be able to say, I want to assign this task for these five books you know, to somebody. It's not there right now, but for the moment, I can assign this. So I'm going to assign this to myself, and I'm going to assign myself drafting, and I'm going to assign myself the keyboarding, and I'm going to assign myself drafting that. Um, and I'm going to these last two things are actually checks. So I've assigned all those things to myself. The administrator's gone through and assigned it. Okay. Now, as a translator, if I were, if I were the translator, not, not the administrator, when I clicked on this assignments icon, instead of it opening to this view, which is called all tasks, it would open to a view that would say, My Tasks. And so what I would see, if I were the translator, and you as the administrator had assigned all these things, what I would see is the tasks that I can now work on. And to me, this is really powerful. Because it gives me an ability to, to set up who's going to work on what when. Okay. Now, notice that I only have three things listed for me. And I assign myself a whole bunch of tasks. Okay, Why is that? Well, let's go back to the all task window. Again, you've got to switch now between a trans this is a translator view, my tasks, and your administrator view, which is all tasks. So when I look at all tasks, what I see is that there are certain tasks that are waiting. Okay? I can't keyboard this task, I can't t keyboard this book until it's been drafted. And I can't draft it until somebody's done the exegesis. Right? Okay, so let me go back to my tasks and I'm going to say, okay, my job is to do exegesis. So I'm working on this book. It happens to be the book of Matthew. It tells me there it's Matt. Okay, so I'm working on this book, and I can approve, I can say that I've completed chapters. Now, there's several ways to complete. One is the plus sign, which says I completed chapter one. Click it again, one and two. Click it again, one to three. Notice that when I clicked it, all of a sudden, Something happened with the draft task. Now, notice that it says Matthew 1 to 3. Since I've done the exegesis for Matthew 1 to 3, the drafting task can now get started for 1 to 3. So, let's say I've done chapter 1. Notice that when I've done chapter 1, all of a sudden now the keyboarding task is available. Okay. So, as I'm doing these tasks, as I complete my task, then that makes the, the next task available. So let's say I assigned myself drafting, but assigned Katie to keyboard. As soon as I click that I'm done with first chapter of Matthew, then that turns it over to her. So now on her task list, it'll say she can keyboard chapter one. Okay. So every time you get on the computer, if you click the button to see assignments, then you can see exactly what you have to work on, which is, again, really powerful in terms of being able to keep track of. Now, who has to do the hard work? The administrator, in terms of setting it up. And that's what we're going to talk about on Wednesday is, again, 
how to go through that setup process. But, but with this plan, with this assignments in progress, we have a way to assign particular tasks or checks to someone. And then as those are completed, it can turn over the rights to the editing and stuff to the next person. So how can you do drafting without keyboarding and have Paratext recognize it? OK, so one of the things that happens with this tool is that this tool makes use not only of things that you do in Paratext, but things that you can do outside of Paratext. So when we're talking about exegesis, the process of doing exegesis is something that you do really outside of Paratext. And the assumption in the seed company prod plan is that drafting may be done outside of Paratext. So in theory, I may give Mary, who's got her book here, she may be drafting this on her paper, and then she may give it to somebody else to keyboard, and they may do the keyboard. Now, it could be that those two steps might be combined. Right. So who, who puts in that she's done chapters one through three? Well, she, either she does it, or you as a consultant or, or administrator would do it. If she doesn't have, she might not even have paratext, but in that case, she wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to sign. If she doesn't have paratext, her name's not going to show up in the list. Right? So I would have to mark that she's done it. So I would mark that, OK, she's done it. We've checked it. So now it can be keyboarded, and we would put it in. Dave? You follow the seed company's procedure for all this. And right. they're the ones that split it up between exegesis and drafting, right? Right. But you could also modify it so that those wouldn't be combined. If you want. Right. right. And so on Wednesday, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about the process of how to to set this plan up. Because in reality, what, what's happening is you've got this high-level plan. Right now, there's three major high-level plans. UBS has one, Seed Company has one, SIL have one. Seed Company and SIL worked together and said, these are the stages that we agree to, and these are basically the tasks we agree to. But they're a little different, but, you know, but basically, these are where we're at. So there's these three high levels. But then below that, the area might say, well, OK, we're going to do this. So you might want to modify it that way. And then within the local entity, when you get to a particular country, you may say, well, in our place, we're going to modify it this way. And then, and then obviously at the team level, you may say, OK, well, this team is here. One of the things that happens is that, for instance, you've got teams. I know there, there are teams that are finishing. So they've already done all the drafting. They're, they're already past that. So, when they start using Paratext 8, they may either just say, OK, complete, 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 complete. Or they may just take it out of the plan completely. Say, we're not going to even say we have those. We've, do we've done it. We're going to have to look at those. Each team, each situation is going to be a little bit different in terms of how we, we adjust it. So we can, we can set up. We've got these two views. My tasks show me what I have to work on and what, um, what needs to be done. Now, you'll notice that down here at the bottom, there's chapter verse and numbers and marker issues. Both of these say these issues. One of the things about the project plan is that not only does it include tasks that you want to complete, but it, includes the, it can include the paratext checks run automatically. So, one of the questions, one of the concerns for us is always, well, has this team run their checks? Have they, have they run the checks that they need to look at for chapter verse markers and, and, and spelling? Have they done those things? Have they worked on the spelling? Well, you can include that right in the plan. And so then it tells me, well, there are 10 issues that need to be dealt with. And if I click on that link, because it's a link, it will actually open up a list of what those 10 issues are so it can be fixed. Okay. And I can either assign that to an individual and say, OK, it's your job to work on those checks, or I could assign it to the whole team, however we want to do it. But those checks are there and, and built in. Do you have a question?
Right, and so when I'm looking, let me go back to the project plan for a second. When I'm looking at this plan, um, and I'm going to turn off the guy just to get the numbers out of my way so I don't have those numbers all over. Okay, when I'm looking at this guy, this plan, there's two tabs up here. One is stages and tasks. And so in here, and again, we're going we're to spend a lot of time on this on Wednesday. I can list what the stages are. These are the high-level numbers. And then what tasks are being done under each stage. There's also a checks tab. And on that checks tab, this lists basically all of the major checks that are in paratext. It doesn't list everything, because there are checklists and things that we'll again talk about. There are other things that can be looked at. But all these checks. And so here, I can say, I want this check to be run at this stage. This indicates the first stage it'll be run at. So for instance, the check chapter verse check gets run in the drafting stage. When you're drafting this, you want to make sure that you've got all your chapters and verses and things. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to get to final typesetting and discover that you're missing chapter 23. You, you know, that's a bad thing. It happens. So you're running this check right in the drafting stage. What happens is if you get all the it cleaned up, it's all fixed, okay? So you go through, you fix everything, which we'll be talking about checking later on. It's all fixed. If later on when you get to stage four, somebody accidentally deletes a verse, that check will still get run. So everything that gets run early gets run every time, okay? But this repeated words check doesn't get run until you get to that stage. Okay, so when you get to, to the preparing for co consultant stage, then it's going to run the repeated words. Okay, so you can determine what gets run when to, to be able to, to set it. When we're looking at, at the plan, what you're looking at is when can you start, when do you start this task? Okay, and also by what point should be finished. So we're saying that drafting or keyboarding the text in paratext, that should be finished in the drafting stage. Okay? I, shouldn't get to the, I shouldn't get to the community testing and say, oh, you know what, I ought to keyboard this. I mean, it's got to be finished up there. Okay? When I'm looking at, at preparing for a consultant, that's when I need to do the back translation. Could I start the back translation earlier? Sure, I could start it any time I want. I mean, I could start it any time, but I have to finish it in order to be done with preparing for a consultant. Okay? So what this plan is telling me is when I need to be finished with this task. We'll talk about how to set when I start it um, additionally. Because again, there's, there's a number of settings. So, so when I'm looking at this, I can set assignments and I can set the, um, when it's been approved, when it's been done, under this all tasks. My tasks show me the things that I need to be working on. There's two other views that we're going to talk about more, but just to bring them up. The stages view, or stages table, is a table you'll notice that it's loading everything here, it's loading all the books, the stages table will show me, I always do this on an entire Bible so it takes a long time, okay. The stages table shows me everything, every stage for every book. And so, for instance, if I have a, a team that's already in stage five when we get to, you know, when we get to Paratext 8, I mean, they've already gone through all the stages. Then, in theory, what I could do is say, okay, drafting is done for all books. So I'm just going to click that. And notice that it's, it's checked for all books. Okay, I'm going to go to team checking. It's done for all books. Okay, when I click that, in my progress level, it's telling me that there are some issues that need to be dealt with. Okay, so before I can go to the next stage, I need to fix these things, okay, is what that's telling me. And actually, if I go down, I'd see some other issues. When I go down to Matthew,
I notice that I have a parentheses here in Matthew showing me that there are issues that need to be dealt with there. So stage one has some issues that need to be dealt with, and stage two has some issues that need to be dealt with. Okay, the tasks have been finished. Whoever was doing the task, but there are some checks that aren't complete yet. So the stages table gives me a way to work with a lot of information, and the task table gives me a view of the particular tasks in the book that I'm in. So I'm in Matthew, and I can see that, okay, exegesis. We've done exegesis on all the chapters. We've done drafting on all the chapters. We've done keyboarding on all the chapters. Because I just went through and clicked all those tasks finished on the other stage. So we can see what needs to be done. So it's a view that gives me a bigger picture. Can you see the issues? This view, I can't see the issues. Okay, so part of this is you have to kind of work back and forth between different views to see what needs to be done. When I'm here in this all task view is where it's easy to see the issues that are, are pending. As an administrator, I can see all of it. And for all these other stages, you'll notice there's simply an arrow that lets me see where I'm at. Um, yeah. I'm saying, no, in the stages, I could click all tasks and say all the tasks are done, but the stage won't be complete until when there's issues. So like right now, when I open this up, I'm still in stage one and it says I'm in progress. Even though all the tasks are marked completed now, I have issues that need to be resolved before I can actually say I'm in stage two. Okay, one of the reasons for this process also is so that at a higher level organizationally we can say okay this seed company project is in stage two okay this seed company project is in stage four and if we say that everybody knows what that means because we're using the same plan we're using the same stages we're using the same information up until now, when somebody says, well, yeah, our project is almost finished. <laughs> oh, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> have, you, have you done this? Oh, no, we haven't done that yet. Have, have you done this? No, no, we haven't done that yet. Well, what does almost finished mean? Well, we've, we've typed, we, we did all the, the keyboarding. Okay, have you done the consultant check? Well, well no, we're almost done with it, you know. So what does it mean? Whereas now, with this plan, if I say, I'm done with stage four, and we're using the same plan, then that's very clear. What does that mean? Okay. Can you come up with a percentage then if a project is 35%? So, how can I see where I'm at? That's a good question. Thank you, Lewis, for leading me into that. Under project, there's also a project chart. And in the project chart, look at that. It tells me that Genesis, I'm 31% done and et cetera, and it gives me the place. Now, in order to really get, in order to really get uh, my numbers, I would need to fill in some end dates. When do I expect to end this? When do I expect to start it? You know, so I need to put some dates to it. But this will give me a chart that tells me basically where I'm at on this, um, this team progress. This is by book. I can also look by book and stage. So if I look at book and stage, then I can see that for Genesis, I'm done with the, the tasks anyway for the first two, but I haven't done anything yet in these last stages. Okay, so I can very quickly see where I'm at, or I can go to a forecast line chart, which isn't going to give me anything useful because I haven't set it up in the registry. And so in order to do that, I would need to register the project and, and set the, the dates. But... Um, but so I can, I can get a, a progress chart that shows it. Now there's one other place that I can get information here. And that is under tools. One of the things that it, it's, the, the developers of this pro program have not tried to confuse us by putting things under different menus. That's not the goal. OK? 
Okay. But there's some things that are specific to a project which are found under the project menu. So my assignments and my forecast charts and things, those are under the project menu because those relate to this project. There's another tool found under the tools menu called Project Health Report. And the Project Health Report, by default, it's going to bring up the project that you're on. So it, it does relate to that project. But it allows me to also bring up other projects. So I could, for instance, say, I want to also see this project and this project and this project. This window that you're seeing is a very common window in Paratext 8 where it selects different projects that you want. What's in the left, what's in the right is selected. You select by either double clicking or clicking and clicking the arrows to move it over and back so you can move things back and forth. And I can move things up and down the list by clicking on the up and down arrows. But so I've selected several projects that I, I'm responsible for. I'm responsible, I'm the consultant on these projects. I want to know where are they. So I've done a send receive so that I get all their information. And I click OK. And Paratext goes out and it's looking at some major indicators. It's looking at where they're at with their stages in their tasks. It's looking at where they're at with their spelling, where they're at with their biblical terms, where they're at with resolving their notes. And I'm just kind of fudging until it finishes here. And it's going through each project, looking at these indicators, and then it gives me a health report for each of these projects. And tells me in the first case, it gives me the stages that are being worked on, and it tells me what percentage of that stage has been done. Okay, So very quickly, I can see that. It tells me what my rate of progress is. It tells me if I've got notes that haven't been resolved. It tells me how many spelling words are marked correct. So you can see I'm not doing very well on spelling in any of my projects. Um, I've only got one that's got 8% marked correct. Everything else is, is still unknown. Um, okay, how am I doing with biblical terms? Okay, well, again, I haven't rendered any biblical terms, so I'm not doing very well. Very quickly, I can see kind of what the health of these projects are. So for you as a consultant or an administrator on a project or a translation um, coordinator or something, this can be a very quick way to be able to get a report on a whole series of projects to be able to work with. And you'll notice that up in the upper left hand corner there's a print icon so you can print this out um, if you need to give it to someone who is not immediately on the, um, on the project. Questions, Ann? Can translators see the health of the projects just from their projects or not? Yes. Uh, anyone, anyone can actually see the health of any projects they have on their computer. Right, so I could have just chosen that one project, or I could choose two or three, depends on what I want to do. Um, Translators making a report to the, the committee that's overseeing them, they can bring up something like this and show this is what we've done and this is what we haven't done. Right, and so yes, if you've got a committee that is not on Paratext, then you could just give them a the report. Now, Again, we're going to talk about registration tomorrow, but one of the things that's different in Paratext 8 from Paratext 7 is in Paratext 7, only the translators could have Paratext. Now, literally anybody in the world can get Paratext. And so if you said, okay, you're my translation committee, and you all have computers, so we're going to put Paratext on your computers so that you can see our project, and we're going to make you observers on it. And you can do that now where you couldn't do that before. Okay. Now as observers, they may not, they're not going to be members of SIL or whatever. They're not going to have access to all the resources. But they don't need all the resources. They just need to see the text. And, they can't make changes in the and as observers, they can't make changes in the text. They can't even write notes as observers. But, um, but you could add them, whatever. But if you've got people and you're saying they're our committee and they don't have paratext, they don't even have computers, they don't even have internet, they have nothing but we want to be able to give them a report, 
then yes, you could, as a translator, you could print out that report and say, here's where we're at today. And if every month you print that out, then they could see and compare. Okay, well, last month, last month you were at 13%, and now you're at 13%. Um, and the month before that you were at 13%. What's going on? You say, oh, well, you know, we were on vacation. You didn't pay us. You didn't pay us. <laughs> see, we would move faster if you paid us. But so, but you know, you say, well, we were at 13%. Now we're at 33%. Now, you know, so you, you have a way of, of keeping track of it. Other questions? What I've just shown you there, none of that requires the internet. Okay, that's all just on your computer. Okay, now obviously, if I want to, if I'm going to share with you, so I'm going to do a send receive so that you can see what I've done, then that requires a send receive. But what I'm doing now, this is just on the computer. It's just on the computer. So this is assignments and projects. We're going to spend, like I said, we're going to spend all day on Wednesday talking about this. Yeah, so, 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 okay, just as an example, if I go to the book of Acts, I think I don't have any issues here. So when I go here, notice that when I went, it opened up to stage two immediately, which means that stage one is done. And if I click on stage one, you'll notice that for chapter verse and markers, there are no issues. So... Paratext didn't find any problems with the chapter verse and markers in Acts. And so it says, good, you're good. Keep going. And it takes me right to the next stage. In Matthew, I have issues. And so it's going to stop me there and say, okay, wait a minute, you got issues. Deal with these. Fix these, and then you can move on to the next stage. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, but when you have the list up with all the little pretty boxes, mm -hmm. Okay, so if I'm in this stage table view that you're talking about, this one? Yeah. Okay, what it's showing here is it's showing me tasks, not checks. So in stage one, in drafting, there are four tasks. There are two checks that aren't being listed. Okay? But those show up in this progress that tells me that in this stage, there's a check that's got errors, it's got issues. So in the, the boxes themselves are showing me tasks. If that, you know, there's a distinction. We'll, we'll talk about more. Can Paratext tell if something's been keyboarded automatically? No. Okay. No, you have to, yeah, okay, yes. If, if that, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yes, when there's a task, when there's the, one of these boxes, Paratext doesn't know. Keyboarding would be a good example. You might say, we're going to make, we're going to make that automatic. But how would Paratext know that you've keyboarded the entire verse? You know, I mean, if I, if I type three words... It can't, it can't count, the, well, there's ten words over here, so there needs to be ten words here. Right, there's, there's, no, there's no way... Well, there's probably a way. I mean, you probably, you could do that. You could say, if I have text in this verse, then say it's done. And so it could, it could just say, okay, well, you're supposed to have text in 20 verses, and you've got text in 20 verses, so we're going to say it's done. That wouldn't be very satisfactory because of all the issues. It tell you, though, that certain key terms were entered in that verse. If you've done your key terms, it could tell you that those key terms are there, but that's typically not one of the issues that you're, you're looking at. Yes. Okay. We'll talk about that. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Uh, suppose you have a project where you're going to work through, uh, maybe we're going to work all the way through a couple of the Gospels. So instead of going down and you know, drafting everything, and we're working, right. working all the way through right. the Gospels. So that, how does that work? In 
Well, I mean, basically it would be the same thing because, you know, you, what you would just see, you'd just be looking across instead of looking down. So if I'm looking at Genesis, I can also come here and say I've, I've completed all the, the stages. Okay, so I could click that. But now it's telling me that there's a bunch of things that need to be complete. You know, there's a bunch of issues that need to be completed. And I, you wouldn't have key terms and stuff like that all taken care of. Right. But so... So when you're looking at this, you can either look at it from the book view or from the stage view. Okay. So again, we're going to spend a lot of time on this on Wednesday. What I want you to capture is this is one of the new features. Okay. To me, this is probably one of the most significant new features. And, and my, my hope is that teams will actually make use of it because it's it's truly powerful, um, but it's going to take some work, you know, in terms of getting it set up and getting things assigned and, and, and working with it. So yeah. Is there an upper limit in the number of uh, issues in a book or in the whole project? Yeah, if you get, if you get more than 1,000 issues, it, throw, it says you can't use paratext anymore. <laughs> no, there's no upper limits. I mean, it just, you know, I mean, obviously... You know, you can only have so many missing chapter verses. I mean, you know, there's a limit to how many verses there are. So if you're missing all of them, that you've reached your limit. But um, you know, there, but there's no, there is no, you know, there's no limit. It'll, you know, if, if you got forty thousand errors, it'll tell you you got forty thousand errors. It won't let you work on forty thousand errors at one time, but um, but it will be there. Okay, so what I want you to do now, now you can put your hands back on your keyboards. We're not going to do assignments and things. We're going to do that Wednesday. But we're going to move to the next new thing, which, again, if you've used 7.6, how many of you have used 7.6? Okay, so less than half of you use 7.6. So the rest of you won't have seen this necessarily. In Paratext 7.5, when you opened up a couple of windows, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up, again, the, um, I'm going to open up my MW project, and I'm going to open up the Darby. So to open up projects, I go to File, Open Projects, I'm going to open the Darby and the MW. Um, in Paratext 7.5, there was no way to necessarily note where I was working in another project. In Paratext 7.6 and in 8, they introduced what's called text highlighting, which means that when I'm in a particular verse in the text, that verse will be highlighted in any other text or resource window that's open. Which is really handy sometimes because you go, oh, that's where, I, yeah, here's, here's where it is. So what I would like you to do is open up, make sure you've got open on your screen the MW project and the Darby project. And I'm going to give you a, a hint. I'm going to give you a, a, we'll talk about this later, but I'm going to give you a secret. If you go to window, tile, or stacked three column, stacked three column, we'll put them in nice neat columns instead of having them just kind of floating around. So if you stack them in columns, it'll put them neatly. Okay, so open up Paratext. Is it opening or it's... Okay, just say no. I think you may have... It. Coming up twice. Let's see, click on, just click it there once. Yeah, click it. Yeah, okay, there you go. Okay, now go to File, Open, Project Resource. The highlighting is so faint, it's the only way I can work it. Ah. I can hardly see that. I can't either. But it does highlight. Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, so you should have two windows open on your screen at least. Oh, 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 oh. MW and and when you're opening projects, when you're opening projects, let me again mention that if you go to File, Open Project, when you see your resources, you can use the Control key to select multiple projects. Okay, so you don't have to open them one at a time. You can use the Control key, hold Control. Or you can use the shift key 
and select a whole string of projects if you want to open up multiple projects. So you don't have to open them one at a time. You can use Control to select them, Shift to select a range. That is standard Windows behavior. That, that's, that happens in almost all Windows programs. Okay? Standard Windows behavior to select. So you should have two windows open. Everybody with me? Darby in the... Okay, so if you click on a text, so I'm in a verse, and if I click on a verse in one, you should see it highlighted in the other text. If I click back in the, the other text, then it should highlight the equivalent verse back and forth. So whichever text I click in, that text my cursor exists in, the other text is highlighted. Now, somebody asked the question, they said, it was so faint they can hardly see it. Okay, so if you go to Tools, Options, Tools, Options, you will see a series of options available to you. Utiles opciones. Herramientas. Uh, herramientas in Spanish. He's using the French. He's using the French interface. Options. Yeah, options. Uh huh. Okay. In this down towards the very bottom, and again, notice the guide. Everybody see the guide? Most of us don't even pay attention to it. You know, we open this up, we don't even pay attention to the guide. Look at number nine. Number nine in the guide. If you go down on the right side to number nine, it tells you what this does in terms of highlighting. If you uncheck that highlight current verse, then it will simply turn it off. Okay? So, and we'll talk about in a second why you might do that, but you can turn it off. But you also see the brightness in number 10. So for me, light is sometimes very faint. So you can choose light or bright. And if you choose bright, you have to restart paratext. Well, I suggest when, when it tells you to restart paratext, I suggest you do. Because, because there are certain features and things that sometimes don't act quite fully right. They mo act mostly, mostly right, but not completely right. So it's not a bad idea when it tells you to restart, to restart. Okay. So, but as some of you found, if you click in another verse, it may come brighter. So all of a sudden now I've got it bright. Does that work better, Pat? Okay. 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 Is it brighter? No, it won't automatically close it. When it says you have to restart, when you, when you say you have to restart, it won't automatically restart. You have, to, you have to do that. Now, this works great when I'm in just a, a verse. This isn't necessarily the best thing if I'm in, say, an introduction or a glossary or something. Because if I'm in... If I'm in verse 0, which is the beginning stuff, which might include an introduction, what it's going to do is it's going to highlight the entire thing in yellow. That may be annoying to have everything in yellow. So let's say I'm working in the glossary, which has no verse numbers, then I may want to turn off highlighting while I'm working in the glossary so that I don't, you know, it's just not all yellow, and then turn it back on. Okay? But when I'm working in verses, this becomes a really useful thing because right now I've just got two texts open, but again, if I were to open up more texts, if I were to open, say, four more texts or five more texts, 
The nice thing here is, is that as I go to verse 1, then verse 1 gets highlighted in every other text that I have open. Okay. So I can very quickly locate the information about those texts. So this is a new feature in, in 8 that wasn't there in 7.5. Okay. To me, really handy. Another highlighting, there's three highlights that we can use in Paratext 8. One is highlighting the verse, and um, I'm going to close this down. Again, here's where I have two choices to close stuff down for me. I either close each one individually, or I'm just going to use my blank window, and then go back and open the project that I want. So I had the Darby and the MW. Okay, so I've got these two windows open. That's, everybody should have those two windows open. Um, okay, so one of the other highlights that's available to us is called the Biblical Terms Highlight. And so I'm going to go to John 1.1. 1, 1. So again, remember there's multiple ways I can get to navigate, but I'm just going to click up here and go to John chapter 1, verse 1. And I'm going to click on View, Highlight Biblical Term Renderings. Highlight Biblical Term Renderings. And notice what happened. So I go to John 1.1, 1, 1, Highlight Biblical Term Renderings, Under View, View, highlight biblical term renderings. And Paratext highlighted those terms. Now that's truly amazing that it can just pick out of the air biblical terms for me. It didn't pick out them out of the air. It, it highlighted the terms that I've already told Paratext are biblical terms. Okay. We'll talk about biblical terms later. Okay, we'll talk about how to how to render them. But if if I've told Paratext to render the biblical terms, then when I go to this view, it'll actually highlight them for me in the text. Again, in my mind, this is really helpful if you're trying to see what biblical terms exist in this verse. Okay, which biblical terms that we're working on exist in this verse. Yes. This this comes now. How did you get this project? How did you get this project on your computer? From the thumb drive, but you restored it from a backup, right? Well, the person who did the backup had worked on the biblical terms before from a, a, a list, and we'll talk about biblical terms and how to get that later on. But yes, I had done this. And then I, re and I backed up the project, and when I backed up the project, my list was included for you. So that's how this is getting there, because I did this work in advance. Okay, Dave? Right. Okay, are you on John 1.1? 1, 1? Are you on the MW project? The M okay, and you go to view. Okay, it doesn't work for Matthew, but it works for John. Yes, yes. Right. So the, the the issue the issue here is the issue here is that the person who worked on the biblical terms worked on the biblical terms in the book of John, but they did not work on the book on the on the biblical terms in Matthew. So if you try to go at Matthew, you won't see it. Okay? It it works here because this is where we were we're working. So what I want you to capture again, yes, Lynn. So if we just want to highlight one one No. No, it'll, it'll, if, if you've worked, and again, when we get to biblical terms, we'll see this, but if you've worked on the biblical terms, it's going to highlight the terms that you've, you've said are biblical terms. So you can't, if, if, you would have to go to your biblical terms list and get rid of all the renderings for everything except Holy Spirit. Okay. 
So in terms of highlighting it, in terms of highlighting it, the only way to make it highlight that would be this, you know, every term that's been done is going to show up in this list. So again, you may say, this is too much. I don't want it. So how do you turn it off? Well, you just go back and do the same thing. You just click on view and uncheck it, and now it's not highlighted. When we talk about biblical terms, we'll review some ways to see the biblical terms that may be more useful in terms of some of the work you're doing. But this is a new feature, this idea of highlighting the biblical terms. There's one other highlight that's new, and that is called View Highlight char Invalid Characters. So if you go to View Highlight Invalid Characters and check that, then what you will see is all the characters that are invalid in this project will be highlighted with a little pink with a line above and a line below. Now, are commas invalid? No. What this means is I simply haven't, I simply haven't gone through and looked at my characters yet, but this is tied directly to the character inventory that exists in Paratext as part of the checks. Again, we're going to talk about checking later, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this now. But this is tied directly to the character inventory. If we go to checking, characters inventory, if you go, if you put in the filter where it says filter here on the right hand side, if you put in the filter, put a comma, it will show you the comma. It says there are 70,549 commas. I hope they're valid. When you're in an inventory, you can say this is a valid character by simply clicking on valid. And we're going to spend a lot more time talking about how this is done. But I'm going to click that and say it's valid. Commas are valid. And I'm going to click OK. And now you'll notice that it's still showing my periods, but my commas are no longer marked invalid. Okay. Where this would be useful is if you've gone through and marked all your characters valid and invalid, and then somebody types a wrong character, it would immediately highlight it. Okay? In Guatemala, we use a, a glottal stop, a saltillo. And we usually use a code that's A78C. It's this big saltillo. Some people accidentally type an apostrophe. Okay? Well, it's really hard to see when you're, when you're just looking at it, it's really hard to see the difference between this little tiny apostrophe and this little tiny saltillo. They look almost the same. But if you highlight it as invalid, then as soon as you type one, you go, oops, we just typed the wrong character. Okay? And you could fix it. So this is something that you probably wouldn't want to turn on until you've gone through and done some of your checking and your inventories. And then you use this as a follow-up to check it and make sure it's right. Um, you can also, this is a shortcut, you can also get to that character in the story by the right click on your mouse over that character. Right. If, you're, if you have an invalid character here, thank you for reminding me of that. If you have an invalid character here and you right click, you get a menu item that says open the character inventory. So if you see a character, you could say, oh, well, that period that period needs to be fixed. So I click it, and not only does it open it up, but it takes me right to that character. And so I could say, well, periods, they're valid. And click OK. And now I can see the next characters that are invalid or inappropriate. Questions? Totally confused? We good? It, 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 links it, it links to it exactly. Okay. Well, you don't have the source language linked to it. Okay, so. It doesn't show you those things. Okay, 
the question, the question is, how does the biblical terms highlighting link to the biblical terms rendering? If, I have, if I'm on my project and I click on File, Open Biblical Term Renderings, then it opens up a window that shows me the terms for that particular text. And so, at, in this case, my screen's not quite big enough to see it, but I can see that I've got these terms, and if I turn on my highlighting, I can see that in verse 1, I have two words that are done, word and beginning. And if I look at my renderings, I can see that beginning is there, and I can see word is there. But I notice that there's also supposed to be the word God in this verse. Um, I'm going to close the Darby for a minute and give myself a little more space. Okay. So I see that the, the word God hasn't been rendered yet. So it's not highlighting it in the text. So if I look at I say, oh, okay, here's the, here's the word for God. So, and we're, again, we're going to talk about how to do this, but I'm going to type God in my rendering. When I type God in my rendering, now God is highlighted in the text because it's an approved rendering. So it's only a highlighting what are approved renderings. Yep. Other questions about these highlights? There's three types of highlights. Well, the renderings we got to under file, open biblical term renderings, but we're going to spend, we're going to have a whole half a day talking about the biblical terms. So again, we'll, we'll, catch that. My, my, my challenge and my frustration, I think I've said it and I'll say it again, but the challenge is, is that there's so many pieces here and in order to do this piece, you really kind of need to have this piece and this piece and this piece and this one and that one, but I can't give them all to you all at one time. I'm trying to give you just a fire hydrant's worth, not a waterfall worth, okay? Um, you know, um, I'm sure some of you are feeling like the fire hydrant's overflowing right now. Um, but, the, but, but hopefully, by the end of our time together, you'll feel more comfortable with all the pieces. But we haven't gotten all the pieces yet. So hang in. Yeah, is there any reason why the, the underline with the little red line starts on verse 19 of John? In the first 18 verses, I don't see any of them. Right, because that means that those, those ones have been corrected. So what you'd have to look at is in verse 19, when you go down to verse 19, what, what character is there? I mean, it's just normal characters. <coughs> Are you looking? But, but is it, what, what character? It's the double quotes. And so that's the first place double quotes occur. So when you're, when, what you're seeing is that the double quotes are marked as invalid, and the first place those occurred, in the first, that's where they occur. So, so, so again, this is where, you know, so then you'd work through it. But you'd want to, you really want to work through your inventory first before you, you do this. All right. As I say, this is about what's new. So we're going to kind of keep jumping. We're going around this way. Okay? The next what's new to me is one that I, I found so incredibly frustrating in working, and I'm so happy that it's here, and sometimes I forget to use it. Um, okay, so set your window so that you have your project open and close everything else. So you just have just the project. MW. MW. Close Darby, close, close everything else, so you just have your project open. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter. So, so we're going to pretend, and again, 
we're going to talk about word lists and stuff later, but we're going to pretend you want to look at your word list for a minute. So to open the word list, to open the word list, you go to tools, word list. And the word list opens. And in my case right now, it's filling my entire screen. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to close my guide. I'm going to close my guide. And I'm going to make, my, make this window. I'm just going to kind of drag the corners a little bit to make it a little bit smaller so that it kind of fits in here next to my project. So I, so I, I close the guide, and I just kind of drag the windows a little bit to, to get it to fit. Everybody happy? OK. Now, in Paratext 7, in Paratext 7, when you're looking at your word list, you see, and you click on a word, down at the bottom, if I, if I click on Aaron, Aaron's one of the first words, if I click on Aaron, down at the bottom I see a concordance view of Aaron. And the frustrating thing is that when you click on one of those links, like if I double click on this first one, it takes me to that verse in my text, but what happened to my word list? My word list disappeared. It's very frustrating. And where is my word list? Well, down on my toolbar, down at the bottom, there's an icon. And so I can go back down there and click on word list and bring it back up. OK, there it is. So in Paratext 7.5 in previous, every time I was working on this, Every time I clicked on a word and double clicked, my word list disappeared. And I go to another word, it disappear. Well, now there is an always on top button. And I can't see it right now because on this menu, when the window gets too small, if the window's too small, then some of the menu items get hidden. And so over on the right-hand side, I see a little arrow. If my window's bigger, I might see it. But what I see is a little pin. Everybody see that little pin? Okay. That pin is the always on top pin. And when you click it, it's either on or it's off. Okay. So you click it, it's on. You click it again, it goes off. Click it again, it's on. Click it again, it's off. Now, watch what happens when I double click on a word. Ha! I can see the word and my word list stays there. And so I have it always on top. And to me, that is just so helpful because I used to get so frustrated that it would get lost. This feature, this feature works in the word list and in the biblical terms tool and in the parallel passages, and in the checklists. And I've put in requests that it really should work in virtually every window that could be on top. You know, if there's a window that can get lost, it ought to be there. Okay? But, um, and so I hope the developers are listening to this. Uh, some of them are going to come down and observe. Um, but, so, the little tack is going to be, there's a little, right here, this little drop down arrow. Yeah. There it is. So the, 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 the thing is, here's the deal, that when you're in these windows, whether it's the word list or the biblical terms tool or the parallel passages tool, um, you may not see this button if your window is too small. So right now I can see it, and I can see it's kind of highlighted, so I see it's on. But if my window gets too small, at a certain point it disappears. And it becomes just a little arrow that indicates there's something more. This is, again, something that's very common in most Windows programs. This is true of Microsoft Word. It's true of most Windows programs that if you have too little space for your menus, then they put a little arrow there to show you that there are more menus available. So if you don't see it, if you don't see it, look for that little arrow to see if there's more. 
very standard Windows operation. Now, if you're using a Mac or a Linux, then, you know, sorry. It's, you know. Okay. So how do you turn it off? So to turn, well, for one, if I want to close the word list, I can just close the word list and it goes away. But no, I think it, you, I think you have to turn it on every time. I think when you close it, it always comes up with it off. I think by default, it's always off. Um, but to turn it off, you just simply click it again. Well, make sure it. Well, you can. Yeah, click it one more time. You can tell if it's off because if you double click on an entry the word list gets hidden. So you know it's on, you know it's on because when you double click on a word at the bottom, a, a, a concordance view, when you double click a reference, paratext stays open. Okay, Steve, help her. Right. Well, because it depends on what's, Open and, and yeah, see yours. Your it's a that's a Mac thing. That's a Mac thing. Well, but see if he goes here. If he goes here, click down here, Kaviti. Click down here, in this on these two. So you can see there's the word list. But the way the way this handles it, Linux handles it differently. You're in a Linux view, and he's in a Windows view. Windows doesn't do it that way. It's one of the things. Okay, questions about the always on top. Again, we're flying. We're flying through some things, but um, the whole the whole point of that is to allow you to have access to both your word list and your text at the same time. Now, if you have two monitors you can take your word list and stick it on the other monitor. And you don't need to do always on top. You, know? um, you can also do this within one window. Right now, I've got these two windows open. I've got the word list, and I've got paratext 8. If those are the only two windows that I have open, when I right click when I right click down on the toolbar, I can say show windows side by side. And what it did is it brought all sorts of things together. Um, oh, that was interesting. Okay, don't try this at home. Okay. But but what I can do, what I can do is that I can take these two windows physically and put them next to each other in Paratext. Now, notice what happened to my Paratext project window. It got really small because I had set mine to be a stacked three column, so I might want to go back to window and stack it with one column. Okay, so now I have my text and I have my window. So there's, there's two, two ways that I can have my word list and my text next to each other. One is that I just tile the two windows so they're tiled next to each other. Okay. Or I can use the always on top button and put it next to each other. Which one's better? It depends. It depends on what you want. One reason that I don't like this view is that with this view, I've lost part of my menu structure for paratext. Okay. So for me, and I also have made my word list really narrow. So for me, I probably would want to go back and make this um, big like I had it and bring this word list down. And again, I've got to change my menus so that they are stacked the way I want them. But bring my word list down and then just keep it always on top. For me, that would probably work better if I have one window, one, one monitor. If I have two monitors, then I would simply take and drag this 
window off and I stick it on the other monitor so I could work. Which is better? It depends on you. Okay. But what I want you to see is that there is a little icon on the word list that you can keep it always on top so that it's available to you. Oh, no, no. oh you're just waving. And that's the little tack. That's the little pen. Always on top. It's the always on top pen. And it exists for the word list, for the biblical terms tool, for parallel passages, and for the checklist tools. And it may, may occur somewhere else. Questions? Comments? Comments? No comments? Right. If, if you're regular working, you know, you right. And so you have to decide. Right. 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 The nice thing is, is that, like, I could have five other windows underneath this, and, still and they'll still be there. So if I've got my Darby under there, and I've got my list, and I've got my notes, and all those things are hidden under there. I can bring the word list up, leave it on top, work with the text, and then close it and, and keep going with what I was doing. Okay. Now, speaking of comments, one of the things that's new in Paratext 8 is the ability to write notes. You could write notes in 7, but could you write notes in the word list? No. In, in 8, there is now an ability to write notes directly in the word list and directly in the biblical terms. So, you're working along, most, those of you who have used Paratext 7 know, hopefully know you can write notes. We're going to talk about notes later, but you, you, know, you can write notes on a word or something. But when you're working in the word list, sometimes you come across the situation where it's a, I need to write a note about this word. Okay? in the word list. I want to say something about this word in the word list or this word in the biblical terms list. Those are called discussion notes and since I happen to have the word list open here we're going to go ahead and talk about the word list. So I'm looking at Aaron and I I think you know I don't think Aaron's spelled right but I'm not sure what it's supposed to be. So I want to write a note to the team about that. In front of the word Aaron, there's a new column that is a question mark. This is your discussion notes. And if you hover over that little icon, it says double click to create a spelling note. Okay? So that little icon in front of the word gives me a place where I can double click and open a note. Now this note looks exactly like standard project notes. Except, you'll notice there's no place to assign this note to anybody. These notes do not show up in the project notes list. So when you're writing project notes, these are separate. These notes are attached to the word list or the biblical terms. So I can come in and say, you know, I think it's supposed to be Aaron. Okay? It's supposed to be triple A double R. I think. So I can write my note and this note will now be attached to that word and you'll see the little icon there that shows me that that word has a note. Okay, Somebody else can come along to it and open the note and say yes I agree, no I don't agree. You can have the discussion, that's why these are called discussion notes, you can have the discussion about this issue right here in the word list rather than in the text. Okay, so this is the idea here is we're, we're talking specifically about 
something that's happening in the word list or specifically about something that's happening in the biblical terms that I can have this discussion and attach this to. Um, now, I only have in this particular word list, um, I'm going to make this big for a second, I only have 13,522 words in the word list. Um, so the question becomes, well, so how do I find those notes that somebody's written? So before we go on any further, what I want you to do is I want you to open the word list, open it, make it full, full screen. Open the word list, make it full screen. Make it big. And I want you to write notes on four words. I don't care what words. Pick four words. Pick them at random. Go way down the list somewhere. Pick a word. Pick four words. Write four notes. I don't care what the note says. In fact, many times when I write notes, let me, let me show you quickly how I write notes, just so that you can you see. If you write notes carefully, it takes a long time. Here's how I write notes. There's a note. When we're testing something, this doesn't have to be perfect. Okay? So writing a note could be just something quickly. So just write, quickly write four notes on four words. Pick four words, write four notes. I assume we're still streaming. <laughs> it just caught up. Yeah. Yeah, it's about 30 seconds behind. So if you're listening to that, it's like, okay, well, this is really weird. Okay, I guess, well, I, I better do this too, huh? Four notes. Okay, I'm picking a word there. Okay, everybody got one note, two notes, three notes, four notes, everybody got four notes? Okay, so now you know how to write discussion notes, that's easy. Okay, now the next question is, how do we find discussion notes? And that goes into another new feature that's in 7, which is filtering. Okay. Now, we had some filtering in 7.5, but in 7.6 and in 8, they introduced kind of a whole new filtering structure that runs across almost all the tools. So whether you're looking at the word list or the biblical terms or the parallel passages or, or, um, or the other tools or whatever they are, all the tools kind of have a similar structure. So we're going to look at the word list for the immediate in terms of how this structure looks. So when you look at the filter, the filters are what run across the top. So right now, there are one, two, three. This, this particular filter has three different drop-downs. The first one tells me all words. But if we click that drop-down, we see several choices. So for instance, I could say find all the words that are incorrect, or all the words that are unknown, or all the words that have unresolved spelling discussion. Woohoo! There it is. So my team has been working on spelling and they've written some notes. How do I find all those notes? I click on unresolved spelling discussion and there they are. There are the words that we need to talk about as a team. Now, you know, when you're working as a team with your a consultant, I know many of you do what we're doing right here where somebody's got the computer and it's being projected up on the, on the wall, and the team is looking at that together. Okay, so, so here we are, we're doing our work, and so now we can actually pull this up. 
If I say, well, no, I, I want to go back and look at the ones that are unknown, I simply change my filter. And now I'm looking at all my unknown words. Okay. So the first column in almost all the filters has to do with which sets of words do you want to look at. Do you want to look at unknown words, or if it's in the biblical terms, do you want to look at names, or what, what do you want to look at? How do you want to filter? The second column is consistently, where do you want to look? Okay. In this case, we're looking at all books. But if I said, I want to find only the chapters that are assigned to me, I could choose that. Or if I wanted to look at the current chapter, or the current book, I could choose certain things. I've got a thing here that says unsaved filter, and then below that, choose verses. Some of the filters, some of the filters will have a place where it will say new filter or create filter, or in this case, choose verses. If I click on choose verses, it defaults me into this very standard choose verse window. Okay. This is a very common window in Paratext. Down the left-hand side, I have some choices. In order to get to them, I need to deselect what's there. And then I could say, okay, choose the New Testament. So now I would be looking in the New Testament. Or I could choose New Testament and choose Old Testament. And now I'd be looking in both. So I can choose that. There's also a place here where it says range. And I could choose and say I want to go from Genesis 1 to Exodus 30 or something. But most of the time, we're going to use the books. But again, new feature here. Well, actually, it may have been existed before. But there's an ability to save something. So up in the upper left, there is a place for you to type a name. So, for instance, if I wanted to choose, and I only wanted to work in the Gospels. You could do this earlier. What? You could do this earlier. Yeah. People don't, just didn't know it and didn't do it. Um, if I wanted to choose the Gospels, I can choose Matthew, and I'm going to hold control, Mark, Luke, and John. So now I've selected the Gospels, and I'm going to give it a name up in the top left. I'm going to call us Gospels. He suggests sometimes putting a month and year, too. Why? Because you may change it and say, well, a long time ago I did this, now I'm doing a new, a, a new one, slightly different. Yeah, if you've got different sets of books, when you do Gospels, Gospels aren't going to probably change. So you're probably safe there. But if you were choosing books I'm working on, um, and here, here's a, a, a comment. This is free. No charge for this one. When you're naming something that you're saving, whether it's a Windows combination or a set of files or something, name it something that's useful. So in other words, if you call it books I'm working on, that doesn't really say anything. Because then you have to have a date and you have to, but then you'd have to remember what, you know, what was I working on in 2015? But if you say Gospels, or you say the five T's, or you say Paul's letters, or you say the Pentateuch, or however you identify it, you know, with a name that makes good sense then it's much easier to get back to that. Okay, so when you're saving something, like in this case I have the Gospels, I, I'm going to call it the Gospels, or I, I might even, even want to say four Gospels. Okay, so the name that I give it, I want to be a name that makes sense. It, the suggestion of putting a date, if, that's, if that helps to keep it organized for you, then you want to put a date there. 
This will be a list that would be available to any project that you're working on. Okay, so I'm going to save that. And down at the bottom, I'm going to click OK. Okay, you'll notice now that in my list of where we're working, it now tells me that I'm in the four Gospels. And I'm looking in, I'm looking in the four Gospels. Again, whether I'm working in the parallel passages, or I'm working in the biblical terms, or in the word list, that becomes available to me. When I click on that drop-down, that now becomes one of the choices that I can work with. Okay. So if you are regularly switching between groups of text, so in one case you're working on the five T's, and then you're working on the Pentateuch, and you want to keep those separate, then saving that set of verses is much handier than always having to go back and control select the five books and remembering where you are. Okay? Plus, by doing it this way, it tells you up in your filter at the top what you're looking at. So by saving it, by saving that filter, you have a very clear way of knowing where you're working. So go ahead and save a combination, go choose verses, choose verses for the five T's. 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus. So choose one and call it the five T's. So choose, make sure you save it with a name. So save a combination for the five T's. You may have to deselect the Gospels to... It should be. I'm pretty sure it is. Steve, isn't it? Or maybe not. No, actually, this may be just project-based. I think it's project-based. I think, I think, well, okay. There's an easy way to answer that question. Questions are always, questions are always most easily answered by trying it. So I'm going to change and go to another project. And I'm going to open my word list. And it is, this is project based. I should have known that. But, you know, the reality is there's way too much in here to keep track of. These lists that you're saving are project based. So saving a list for one project won't transfer it <coughs> to the next project. So you can see that I'm in a different project right now. And in this project, I've already got four different choices that were saved. Okay. And so, it, and, and these didn't show up, Pentateuch didn't show up in my other projects. So these don't cross projects, you know, so you don't need a project name. This is specific to the project. But it does go with the project, so when you share it, then it should be available. Right, right, yeah. So, so what you're doing is you're setting up what, what books you're going to look at, what chapters, where you're going to look. And in this case, you have the advantage of being able to save a filter. Okay, the last filter here, and again, I'm going to make this window bigger so we can see it all. The last filter here has to do with finding. And there's two places to find something in the word list. I can find it in a word itself or I can find it in a spelling discussion. 
Okay? So if I know that in a spelling discussion I had written some particular thing I was looking for, I could look for that spelling discussion. But typically, this is going to be used for looking for a word. So typically, you're going to leave it on Word, and you can start typing. Now, this filter, when I start typing, as I type a letter, basically, it starts filtering the word list so that it only includes that letter. If I type another letter, it continues filtering the word list so that it only shows me words that has that combination. And so I can get down to where it becomes easy to find a particular word by just filtering it down through that list. Here's an interesting problem. If you type in Jesus lowercase j, or just instead of Jesus, and you'll see in the list that it's lowercase j at least for mine. Where's the What? I'm in a different project. Okay, good point. And here, herein lies one of the things that will catch you many times. Very good. You get the prize for that, Katie. You can have lunch today. Um, it's, on your, it's on your own pay, but you can have lunch. Um, many, many times, if you've got multiple projects open or something, you start doing something and realize you're looking at the word list for the NIV. Or, you know, or you're checking you know, the Reina Valera instead of checking your project. So obviously what you do depends on where you're at. So let me go back. What are you in? Uh, the MWBT. Okay, so I'm in here. I go to Tools, Word List, and I bring up Jesus. Well, this is true, so I'll go to change my filter. Man, you guys are way picky. Okay, you guys are way picky. Okay, so I go to all words. So again, it's important to know what filter is in place. If my filter is Exodus, then I'm not going to find Jesus there. I mean, he was there, but, you know, it's, it's, you know. Okay, I have to have, I have, to have my filter. And, and so, again, the filters are wonderful things, but they... They will trip you up if you are in the wrong place. Notice now that the filter for the find over on the far left tells me that what I'm looking for is a find word Jesus. Okay, and then it's in there. Okay, so what's your question? Okay, you have lowercase Jesus, but I'm trying to figure out where is that by the find feature. Oh, just click on it. By the find feature? Yeah, if I click on that, there's 600 something. Right, okay. Um, Okay, it's almost time for lunch, so I will just I will show this to you. One of the things that happens, so I look at Jesus, and Jesus is lowercase, and we all know that Jesus is uppercase. Well, even bar Jesus may be uppercase, depending on how you spell it. But but Jesus as a whole word should be uppercase. Everybody agree? Yeah. Yes. Should God always be uppercase? No. Not necessarily. But Jesus there's probably no cases where Jesus would be written lowercase. So I'm going to mark this as incorrect and say that it's supposed to be capital J. Now, there are other issues here with this apostrophe and stuff. We're not worried about that. So I'm going to say it's supposed to be capital J. Now, one of the things that happens is that it goes through and it looks to see if there are any lowercase j's for Jesus and if there existed any lowercase Jesus, it would have changed it right then. Okay. So this is why if you say God should be uppercase, then it'll go through and try to make all the gods uppercase. Yeah, but you can do yes, no. You can do yes, no, yes. You can, yes, you can. But you can say no, don't make this one uppercase. But, but so it will try. So it didn't find any lowercase Jesus. Okay. But, but what happens is... Um, let me, let's take a look at this. Let me just go to this Jesus. Let's say for a minute that somebody accidentally typed this lowercase Jesus. What's going to happen to the word list is it's going to tell me that Jesus is not always capitalized. This is a new feature. 
I think. Well, no, it's probably been in 75. But it's going to tell me it's not always capitalized. And I've got a couple of choices. One is, show me the incorrect one. Or both forms are OK, or just go ahead and capitalize everything. Okay? I don't care. Don't show me it. Just capitalize them all. Okay? So, but I want to see where is this one that's lowercase, particularly if we're talking about the word God. Okay? So one thing I might want to do is I might want to make, say God should always be capital, and then say show me the ones that are incorrect so I can find the ones that are, are supposed to be a false God. Okay? It's how you decide to work with it. But, so if I show me an incorrect, ah, there it is genealogy of Jesus, that's wrong. I could either run the correction, I could either say capitalize it all, or I could just go ahead and fix it. When I fix it, now the error goes away and it shows me. So capitalization is an important check in paratext, and after lunch we're going to be talking about some of the new features in the, in the checking um, of the word list. But um, but capitalization is, a, is a, an important check that can be done. So it kind of depends on how you want to, to handle your capitals and not. So any questions on what we've, we've been talking about here? So to summarize, if you make a change, you decide that you are going to accept only capital letters and the name Jesus, and then somebody writes a, a small case letter, something should So in the word list, in the word list, well, we'll check it. In the word list, did you save the text? Make sure you save the text. If you don't save the text, paratext won't know it's been done. So if you change the text to lowercase, you have to save it. And then it should, should pop up. So why did the text show it if you didn't answer her question? Well, it does show up automatically, but you have to save the text. So, so if I come over here to Jesus again, and I just change that to lowercase j, Nothing's going to happen in the word list. Okay, nothing happens because Paratext doesn't know I've made the change yet until I save it, unless I'm, you know, you know, if I go somewhere else. So as soon as I save it, then the word list should refresh, and then it comes up and tells me I have an error. I just added it. I put it in there. I manually put it in there. No, our original list. Your list didn't have any lowercase j's. Okay, so the way Paratext does it is it, 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 it doesn't know necessarily what's capital and lowercase. It, it, typically, it will put capitals for words that are almost always capital, but not always. So in this case with Jesus, it, just did, it used a lowercase j. So it doesn't, it doesn't know, for instance, that Abraham is a name that should be capitalized. So it might have capitalized it, but it might not. So as you're looking at the word list, you might want to say Abraham should have a capital A. Okay? But again, the problem becomes you might have a word that only occurs at the beginning of sentences. But it's not a capitalized word. It just happens that it always occurs at the beginning of a sentence. You know? So it actually would be a lowercase word. You know? um, it, so to, Right, right. So when a word is written lowercase, then it basically you're saying this word could be upper or lowercase either way. It doesn't matter. When you say it's, when you put it as an uppercase, you're saying it has to be uppercase. It is time for lunch. We will continue at 1:30. You can leave your computers and things here. We'll lock up the door. People will be around. Um, does anyone want to come back here? I, you know, I'm going to lock the door until at least one o'clock, unless somebody says they're going to come back here before one. Is anybody going to come back before 1? Okay, 1 o'clock, I will plan to be back here and have the door unlocked for you. Um, for those of you who are, are new to the JARS campus, the cafeteria is in the Townsend building across the street. Across the street that way. Um, and um, they've got lunch over there or, you know, whatever. So we will start back at 1.30, but I will be here at 1.
the security for those who need security badges, get those at um, after about three o'clock.